Hey ballers, it's John Horton, and this is uh, the pilot episode of what I hope becomes Baller News. So tonight we are going to preview the 2014 uh, Pro Men's Solemn Season, and especially talk about Uma Masters. On the other end of the phone, I have with me a guest host, esteemed photographer, videographer, boat designer, ski designer, and by the way, the 2005 Mumu Master Slalom Champion, Mr. Marcus Brown. Marcus, how are you, man? I'm good, man. I don't know if that uh, Mumu Master's title... Marcus, I lost you. We got our first blooper. I hear you just fine, Johnny. Mar um, I don't know if that Mumu Master's title is helping me or hurting me. That's like a long time ago, dude. 2005. <laughs> <laughs> man you gotta be proud i, I guess yeah. i am proud i am proud no for sure it's um it's a great tournament and i will say that uh even though i can't be there this year uh the next best thing is talking to myself on a computer screen with you in my <laughs> ear about moomba this is pretty cool yeah all right well yeah hey before we get started talking about moomba um tell me about your winner what have you been up to uh <clears throat> What's up with uh, what's up with Mastercraft and HO? So yeah, things have been uh, pretty crazy for me for the last couple of years. I've been doing a lot of design work for Mastercraft and for HO. Um, I helped design the free ride. I was pretty integral in the uh, new Mastercraft Pro Star. So this last winter, I've been spending a lot of time going to boat shows, talking to people, um, showcasing the new product, the new boat, the new Pro Star that we have. So that's. That's taking a lot of my time, and then also I'm working on a bunch of films right now, uh, different, various uh, projects for different companies, different people. So, yeah, exciting stuff, but um, doesn't leave a whole lot of time for uh, for uh, anything else, any fun. So I'm trying to trying to balance it. I'm trying to figure it out right now. Well, man, you need to get some skiing in this year. You got to come down and see me. I'm uh, <laughs> I've got an empty ski lake right now. It doesn't have any water in it, but. Uh, putting floors and kitchen in it this week and a uh, couple of weeks I hope to put it, be putting water in it maybe come down and take a ride. Nice. I, I would like that. It's probably going to be warm down there pretty soon so I'm I'm down for sure. Hey and just it real is. quick just real quick John I want to say I really appreciate the fact that you uh, take your haircut money and time and you put it into <laughs> making the sport better through ball spray and continually pushing the limit with this new uh, ball spray news and I can relate to that. Uh, taking your lunch money or your haircut money and, and doing something else with it. So thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. Thank you, man. I, uh, I, I do save a lot of money on hair product. <laughs> so, uh, so hey, so you, uh, how many times have you skied Moomba? You skied it, uh, obviously, uh, more than just 2005. 2005, 2007, 2008, and I think 2010. I, I don't really remember. I was just looking through the results, um, but I think those four times. Yeah, I think that's it. Obviously, my first year down there was my best year. No, nobody ever won their first year down there in 2005. And uh, after that, let's see, 2007, I think I tied for second with Aaron Larkin. Um, 2008, I can't remember what happened. I think I got fourth or fifth or something. I think every year I've gone, I've, I've made the... Uh, I think every year I've gone, I've made the finals, so... In 2010, I think I got um, probably fourth or something. So, anyway, it's a heck of a place to ski. But yes, I do have a certain place in my heart for the Yarra River, and uh, that's why I'm excited to talk to you about it right now because this is, in my opinion, the biggest spectacle in our sport. This is the biggest event we have in front of real live humans in a really cool so place. So it's it's really it's it's Moomba, <clears throat> and then it's I don't know, uh, the Malibu in terms of crowd, as far as actually fans on the shore, is that, is that right? Or does Moomba dwarf them all? Uh, Moomba pretty much dwarfs them all. If you, if you go to Moomba, like they talk about, it's, uh, maybe 200,000 plus people throughout the whole wow. course of the, uh, the whole course of the week. It's a whole festival, but at any given time, like for the finals on the, on Moomba Monday, there's probably a good 20,000 plus or minus people, maybe 30,000 on a really good Moomba Monday when it's 80 degrees out. Uh, so that's that's pretty special. That's you, We don't get that a lot. You don't get that a lot in hardly any sports. So pretty pretty cool. 
Pretty cool to be a part I, of. Well, hey, uh, Marcus, so one of the things that, that the Yara River and the Movie Masters is notorious for is the water conditions. Is it's the, the tide's going in and out, so the water level's going up and down, and the water's <clears> moving. Uh, what can you tell us about slaloming in that event? Uh, you know what? Slaloming at the Mooba Masters on the Yara River is, is a very weird sensation. When you normally ski and you train in your private lake or somebody else's private lake, the water is like a sheet of glass, literally. So that means it's completely flat. The Yara is a river. It's got current. It's, uh, it's the going in and out. It's got sea walls that are vertical. As hard as they try, it still has a lot of backwash. So what you get is you get a like a bathtub, a real live bathtub, but it's full size and you're in, in it with a boat and you're trying to ski and you just paid, you know, two or three thousand dollars to get down there for one chance to make it to the next round. And so you ball all that up and it's a very nerve wracking, very, um, very challenging situation because what you're used to doing which is going out and, and you battling the boat, battling the buoys, riding your ski as well as you can, now becomes survival because you don't know where those buoys are going to be. As you get closer to them, they move. As you get closer to them, you're moving in ways that you never really can practice for because the current's always changing. And the, the actual surface of the river is going, it, it's, it's doing this, it's going up and down. So at some points... It, the water kind of falls away from you when you're going to try to execute a carve or create a turn at a buoy at other points coming into the wakes the river can kind of come up underneath you and kind of crush you and kick people out the front or make them let go because they're going to go out the front so it's a very unique place i think that's why uh, a lot of skiers either love it so much or they really hate it um, i know some people have bad luck there some people have good luck i'm fortunately one of the guys who've had who has had great luck but that doesn't mean that it won't swallow me alive at any point. And the same goes for everybody. Um, so, yeah, it's a very, very challenging uh, site and one that um, is hard for not only the skiers, but the, but the, uh, the officials and the driver, drivers and everybody involved, really, to put on the show and to make the event go. So, you know, the last couple of years, uh, gate judging has been, a big, it's been a big subject. And if you're for it or against it, it's definitely controversial. Um, is Moomba the one event that because of the water conditions are so crazy that they should just disregard entrance and exit gates? Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to, to speak to that because I still think going through the gates is an integral part of skiing. And if you're, you're going to say, okay, Moomba, this is the one event where guys, you don't have girls and guys, you don't have to go through the gates. Well then... What about the next year saying, okay, well, we're going to let you have one of the six buoys uh, mulligan. So you can only go, you only have to go around five of the six. So if you're really laid out of five, just get back to the wakes, go through the exit gates, and, and we'll give that pass to you. So that's kind of a slippery slope. What I would recommend is I would recommend kind of this rule that's been floating around. And, of course, I haven't been keeping up with my ball of spray homework, so I don't know what the latest is on it. But that is this rule that um, you can take a mulligan pass and basically opt up. So if I miss my gates on my very first pass, tail current, my timing was way off. I just got off the plane yesterday flying in from California, and I missed my first pass on the Yara because or I missed my gates, actually. Um, I would be able to opt up to 35 off or whatever my next pass is. If I prove I can run that one, then I get credit and I get to continue on. That, to me, is the best. Of all the events that we have, that, that rule should be... A given at that at that site because it's not a it's not a, a permanent tournament site it is a one-off tournament site so there's only the buoys on that lake or on that river are only there for one week out of the year so and that's in that case yes there should be an exception it should be a rules exception to where an athlete can opt up if they miss a gate and they don't aren't completely screwed now last year was it nate did they miss his gates at 41 is that what happened I, I don't recall. I think he misses gates at 39 or 41. I think I think he actually, I don't know, maybe it's a Masters I'm getting screwed up with. But either way, if somebody yeah, misses... Masters, 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 Okay, yeah. so if somebody misses their gates at 39 and a half off, and th to win, they need to run two at 41, then it's going to do them really no good to miss their gates at 39 and then try to opt up 
because they'd have to run a full 41 pass to get credit for 39 and 41. So it's, I think it's a great rule. It's not, there doesn't okay. really leave much room for cheating. And it, I think it should happen at this site. I agree. Okay. Interesting. I happen to agree with you hundred percent. So, so let's move on. Let's talk about the field and you know, uh, we can't talk about everybody in the whole field, but as I starting with women's slalom, um, the fifth from the top skier is somebody that we've seen in the, in the sport for an awfully long time, Emma Shears. So oh, yeah. I'm super excited to see her back. What can you tell us about Emma and Emma's skiing? Emma is a fighter. She is, uh, she's been around for a long time. When she, was a, when she was doing both jump and slalom, she was winning pretty much everything, both every weekend. Um, she's very she's an animal she's a gamer she's a competitor she's gonna do what it takes to win i think last year she got i know she made the finals i don't know what what place she got you probably know but um i i i don't know but i do remember seeing her equipment was 10 years old and kind of laughing about <laughs> well i guess all it takes is some skill yeah exactly that that's kind of that's kind of standard when you see guys like carl robert come back they're usually using old equipment okay she got second i just looked it up uh, right. I, I, I would not count her out. I know she's trained hard. She, for God's sake, she's going to, you know, represent uh, Australia in the bobsled in the Winter Olympics. So she's a phenomenal athlete. And, of course, she's skied that, that site more than most girls out there combined. So I, I wouldn't put it past her. And then Whitney McClintock, obviously. She's uh, Well, hold on, hold on. You're getting ahead of us. Can't sorry. talk about Whitney sorry. Yet. So, so fourth from the top is a young woman that I think you've probably skied with quite a bit. I think you guys are on uh, Team Mastercraft and Team HO together, and that is Brienne Dodd. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Okay. Now, now she looks she looks like a sweet little woman until she puts a slalom ski on, and then she kind of becomes Godzilla, doesn't she? Yeah, she's got uh, like superhuman strength, and <laughs> I don't know where it comes from because she. She always talks about needing to work out more, but she never really works out more. But she still looks super strong, ski super strong. So um, I think she's obviously, if she's on, and it's a very tough site, and she's a really short, probably the shortest one in the field, shortest skier. So if she's on and she's she's really clicking with the river, I think she can go a long way. I've seen her run some really deep buoys there, but um, it just makes it tougher being a shorter skier. She has to ski to a wider point to get her ski around, to get back to the wake. So um it's going to be a tough it's going to be an uphill battle for a girl like her but i think she can i think she's got potential definitely to be on the podium if not on the top so third from the top is is a woman that i associate with overall and really tricking from france uh clementine lucille and i, I don't know anything about her slalom clem she's good she's a left foot forward skier um she's again she's one of the top overall skiers in the world so she's really, really light on her ski. What I mean by that is maybe it comes from a tricking background, but she doesn't really push when – she pushes only when the time is right. So you won't see her blow the ski out a lot. You won't see her get in too deep, or if she does get in too deep, she's strong. She can hang on to it. So in that respect, that those attributes are what you need on the Yara. Don't push when you can't push, when your ski is not ready for it, but also uh, being able to hang on to stuff – to make it to the next buoy and to keep yourself alive. So she comes out of nowhere. She's a sleeper. She's a dark horse, but don't count her out. She's the third seed going into the first uh, first round. So, yeah, yeah, I see Clem potentially doing big things. She's been there before. All right. And then second, second seed in the women's is, a, is a, a woman that I think is maybe one of the most technical 34-mile-an-hour skiers in the world. I think a lot of people that – if they're watching carefully or trying to emulate. And that, of course, is April Cobel Eller. <clears throat> yep. A April's phenomenal. You know, she has a very stacked, very aligned uh, skiing style. She's been doing it for a long time. She's still doing it. Maybe better now than she ever has been. And uh, it amazes me each year she continues to, to put out big scores and to get big placements at big events. So... Uh, again, she's. I think she's got some experience there, and experience on the Moomba or on the Yarra River is um, invaluable. You cannot have too much experience there, because the more times you ski there, the more you understand it. I think the better you end up skiing because you have that sense of calm, because you know what to expect. Fair enough. And then top seed, 
Um, absent, uh, I don't know who would have been top seed if, if Regina had been there. It's Regina and Whitney are, are number one, two in the world, back and forth. But I guess Regina is staying home and working. And that leaves Whitney McClintock as top seed. So, Whit, I just was looking at the results. Uh, 2013, she won. 2012, she won. Wow, 2011, she won, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm wow. getting all screwed up now. Apparently, she's <laughs> won a couple times in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, I was looking, too. She's a left foot forward skier. And uh, apparently, the guys for the last 10 years are five and five. Five righties and five lefties have won throughout the last huh. 10 years. So for women, uh, I, I didn't really find a pattern. I thought it was going to be one or the other. But for women, it's probably about the same. And But Whitney's got the last, at least the last one or two years under her belt. So she's got confidence. She's a past world champion in slalom. She is, uh, I know she's, she's training hard throughout the winter. Um, she's tough to beat. When she's on, she's very tough to beat. So those other girls are going to have uh, a big number, I'm reckoning, to put, to put out there to chase her. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far, but it's interesting that you're commenting on left foot, right foot. I would think that in very adverse conditions, right foot forward skiers would have an advantage because of a better gait turn in. No? It's hard to say uh, because, you know, with the head current, tail current situation at the Yara, um, I think that changes the whole game plan. You know, what a lot of people try to do at Moomba is they try to take a head current and uh, for their hardest pass and that's maybe that's changed but uh, every year I went people were always trying to, to equate head current to head wind head wind usually is a little easier because it helps you slow down the problem with the head current at the Yarra River is if your boat speed through the course relative to the course is 36 or 34 for the women 34.2 miles an hour then and the current is two miles an hour then your ski speed on top of the water is actually 36 so on a head current Sometimes it's a lot harder to keep your ski in the water to create a turn because for the guys, say two mile an hour head current, that's like 38 miles an hour. So it feels like all of a sudden wow. you're, you're riding on ice. So in head current, a lot of times people think it's, it's going to make them feel slower, but in all actuality, it makes them feel faster. So I remember a couple of years ago when um, Aaron Larkin won, um, a lot of guys were having trouble with the gate on, on, in a head current, and it was especially big that year. So it depends on the current, depends on the conditions, but I don't know. Maybe a righty has an advantage on that gate shot, but but then the lefty has three good turns, and that one ball turn is usually either way, head current, tail current, is usually a decider. If you don't get a good start and you're scrambling, then you make mistakes on the yard. And if you're a lefty and you get a great one ball, you're that much better off than somebody who's a right forward skier and, and botches one ball and tail turns, and now they're scrambling, they're making up time. And uh, we're ready to talk about men's slalom. So uh, I really want to talk about the top 10 at Moomba, but you can't look at the entry list. And I don't, this may change before the tournament, but you can't look at the entry list without noticing number 16 from Great Britain, Andy Mapple. Marcus, I thought Andy retired. I thought he quit. Yeah, I thought Andy quit too. <laughs> In like 2005, actually, or 2006. Maybe it was 2007 or 8 or 2010. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, Mapple just keeps coming back. I know he's in incredible shape. He's over 50. He is still a very formidable force, even though he likes to retire. You know what? I talked to him a year or two ago about this, and he said he would love to try to compete full-time again. But, A, there's not a whole lot of you know events to compete at. B, to get to the level to where to reach his max potential, he would have to devote way too much time. And he's beyond that. He's already done that. So C, he just right. says, you know what? If I can pop in every once in a while, I'm I'm gonna try to do that, I guess. And uh, I don't blame him. I you know. If he can half if he can half so. ass, half ass his way to the podium, that's still pretty dang good. I don't think anybody else in the world could do that. No. Alright, number ten on the list from California. Mr. Brian Detrick, Team HO. What do you got to say about Brian? Yeah, BD. He's coming on the last couple of years. He's uh, he's one of these guys, kind of a self-made man, and he's uh, I think he's very uh, capable. He's very he's got a lot of potential. Um, one thing that you'll notice about Brian is he sometimes tends to 
uh, go from really pretty to really ugly or blown up within like one buoy. So on the Yara, I don't know if he's ever skied there. I think he did last year maybe, but he's uh, he's really going to have to keep calm, stay within his means, and not push the envelope because he'll push the envelope, he'll go out the front at 35 off, and that'll be the end of his round. Or he'll run deep yeah. into 39 and a half off, and he'll be the top seed into the second round. So he's got he's got all the potential. Yeah, Detrick is uh, there's potential for entertainment from shore for oh, yeah. sure. Yep. So uh, ninth on the list uh, from the Czech Republic, overall skier and overall <laughs> good guy, Adam uh, Settlemeyer. Yeah, Adam, he's a great guy, sledgehammer. He's a uh, world champion three event skier, so slalom, trick, and jump. But he's still very capable on a slalom ski. Matter of fact, um, he's always a threat. He can always run 39 and a half off, really no matter where. Russia at the World Championships. Um, on the Yara, I could see him going out and running 39 if the conditions are good. And so that's what it's going to take to win. And a guy like Adam could get it done. He's very light on his ski when he needs to be. He can hang on to a lot of crap, just like Clem on the women's side. And he's very well balanced. So if he's on and he is not over skiing and getting late and getting behind, I feel like this guy could be one of those dark horses that could come from the number 10 or 9 spot and keep himself in the top all the way through the end of the weekend. Absolutely. So number 8 is uh, a gentleman I've only met once or twice, Mr. Nick Adams. I don't think most of our viewers are going to know anything about Nick. What can you tell? Uh, Nick Adams, uh, unfortunately, as little as everybody knows about Nick here, everybody in Australia knows him. And he's been a, a staple, if you will, at the uh, Moomba Masters for a long time. Um, Nick is a pretty skier. He's a very, very um, technical. He's got a, a lot of touch. He's very soft and light on a ski. Sometimes this kind of guy, I just want to see him like go for it. I just want to see him crank and turn. But he never does. <laughs> he just kind of does his thing and kind of reminds me of the old Steve Cockrum, who would just kind of like almost looked like he was not doing a whole lot, but he would still make buoys. And so, again, Nick yeah. can be a threat. I know a couple of years ago in Milwaukee at the Malibu Open, he came out, ran 2 at 41 in like one of the first rounds, and a lot of us were sure that it was 39 and a half off, but it, it, you know, 41 looked like 39. He made it look that good. So, again, if he stays calm and he doesn't fight the Yara, he's skied there plenty of times, probably more than most of these guys. He could, he could be a threat, and I would like to see him there. Obviously, he's an HO teammate, syndicate teammate. He's a really stand-up guy, and this is his home country, so maybe the God can let him, the gods can let him, you know, make the podium one of these, <laughs> one of these years. Maybe this is his year. All right, so uh, next year on the list is uh, not the prettiest skier in the world, but maybe the prettiest skier on the list and past world champion, Thomas DeGasper. Tegas, yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for them to come out with a five-hour energy uh, tea gas edition. You know what I mean? Uh, when, when are they going to do that? I do. That, that would be great. Just like a little, have it shaped like a little gas can. Say tea gas on it and yeah, pink. But, yeah. Um, tea gas flavor is a terrible idea. I, I know. I know. Um, it, you can make it. You can put a lot of caffeine in there, though. So tea gas. He's like you said. Uh, some people think he's not a very pretty skier, but if you look at, you, I like to do this. From time to time, you look at a skier and you break them down to the nuts and bolts, basically where their mass is, where the forces are, how they're accepting those forces from the ski, from the boat. T-Gas does a lot right. And a lot of people don't don't see that because he's in these weird contorted shapes. And that's maybe why he's had some low back problems. But overall, he does a lot of things right a lot of the time. That's why he's a two-time world champion. That's why he is who he is. Um and I think this guy, obviously, I don't know why he's number seven on the list. I feel like he should be a little higher, but uh, he's you, you got to watch out for him. Um, any given time, he can bust the score out. He could, I could see him running deep or mid to deep 41 off if the conditions are right on the yard. So number seven, he should be a little higher. He's sandbagging. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, number six is uh, pretty much uh, everybody's buddy, uh, Aaron Larkin. <laughs> From New Zealand, great guy, amazing skier, and past Moomba, and I believe he's a Moomba champion, but certainly past uh, elite list number one skier. Yeah, yeah. A couple of years ago, he was number one in the world, which I know was a very big uh, goal of his, and he actually he never really thought it was going to happen, and he actually skied his butt off that year and 
became number one in the world, and that was a huge achievement for a guy like him, for anybody, let alone a guy who right. who had came from kind of nothing. He wasn't, you know, you ask him, he wasn't that great of a skier as, as a junior, and he just worked his butt off, and he became the best skier in the world. Um, personally, if I could uh, plug into the Matrix and extract all of his commentary uh, uh, expertise and his <laughs> his uh, flamboyant, um, you know, Whatever you call, every time he's on the mic, he's perfect. He's he's got a uh, he's got a word to say to everybody. He's got a saying for every situation. So I wish I had that. I'm jealous of that more so than his number one in the world ranking. But the guy's a left forward skier. He can hammer out good starts on the yard, head current, tail current, and he's been there before. He's won twice, I think. Um, and I've had the the luxury of of going up against him many times. He's a great guy, stand up guy. He's fun to be be around on the dock but he's a true competitor and when you think he, you're, he's down he's not down so don't turn away until you see the handle bouncing behind the boat that's 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 my piece of advice for everybody else in the field and it should be noted about larkin um he actually improved on his personal slalom his personal high score ever last year he had been uh, mr two at 41 for I don't know how many seasons, and he finally pushed that up to three at forty-one. Mm -hmm. And I know that that was a uh, getting a big monkey off his back last year. So he ended last year on a high note. Yeah, he did. He did, and that was a big deal for him, uh, especially being a left forward skier and not being able to ever get to three. I think that was kind of a a, uh, a roadblock, and he he finally overcame that. So great skier, very capable. One of my top choices for this weekend, honestly. So, uh, skier at number five is somebody that I don't think anybody's heard of. I mean, Freddie Winter, who in the world has heard, heard of Freddie Winter? But I also think the skiing world needs to stop and take a long look, because this young man really impresses me. Oh, totally. His hair, number one. His hair impresses you. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, yeah, Freddie Winter, I mean, this guy, is, he's kind of got the whole package. He's, he's tall. He's strong. He's got great technique. He's very solid. He's always connected to the line on the way outbound. He's never got a loose rope. And uh, he proved himself last year, I think, to me and to a lot of people. And so to to see what he does on the Yara, I'm kind of excited about because, again, the Yara is a little bit different of an animal than any other lake you're, or river you're going to ski on. So I don't know if he's ever skied there. You, maybe you know. I'm, I'm not sure. but um, I don't think so. He could surprise the heck out of some people. Um, would you so would you classify his style if we're talking about styles since most people haven't seen him that he's kind of got that parish thing going on where he's tall and still and his movements are really deliberate are you really going to quiz me on style right now you know how okay i'm sorry that. i'm sorry you know, i'm sorry you, my, my mistake we'll edit that out <laughs> is there what does style even mean i don't even get i don't even get style we're, this is a whole I'm nother so conversation sorry. it's a whole nother conversation okay. We'll, we'll come back to style some other time. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh, after Freddie Winter, really one of the great slalom skiers of the era. Uh, man that I am just so impressed with. Uh, also, HO teammate of yours, Mr. Will Asher from Great Britain. Yeah, Will, he's, uh, he's pretty sensational. Ever since the first time I saw him at Trophy Lakes, uh, we had the uh, one of the pro events there maybe like 12 years ago or 10 years ago at least, and uh, he came out and ran 39 and a half off a couple of the rounds, and nobody had ever heard of him. He kind of did what Freddie Winter did last year, um, quite a few years before him. He always looked up to Mapple. He trained hard like Mapple. He, he, he has, he has the, the uh, list to prove it. He's got a couple world championships. He's won countless pro events, and he has been the guy to beat until Nate Smith came along. But Willie still, I feel like, is is the guy to beat at certain events because he, above all else, he is more connected with his equipment, his ski, his his uh, ski setup, his boot setup. He has that more dialed, and he's he's done more iterations on ski setup than anybody else. I think all the the top ten put together. That's how mm. much time Willie spends not only on the ski equipment, but then you look at him in the gym off the water. He's uh, he's committed, and I think he's kind of frustrated that uh, he's been having a little bit of a slow go the last couple of years. So I think this year, more than ever, I think Willie, um, I think you're going to see him do some amazing stuff this year. And I hope it starts at Moomba, honestly. I, I do too. I'm uh, In theory, I'm impartial, but I'm cheering for him. 
So, uh, next here on the list, freshly married, Mr. John Travers. Yeah, JT just tied the knot. Really cool to see. <laughs> he's, a, he's a great guy. I remember almost like yesterday that uh, the first tournament that he ran 38 off, 11 two five meter rope in a record tournament. That was at his lake in uh, Florida. And all of a sudden, he was winning events. And now he's one of those guys that you're, we're going to look back on in 10 or so years. And he's going to have left his mark. And uh, I think if he can relax and, and realize that he's already made it and he's already that guy, he's already one of the greats, that a tournament like this has his name all over it. Because he really can, when he is on, he can ski through anything. And uh, mm. the Yara included. So he skied there before. We we were he and I were there uh, for the last couple of years that I went, and uh, great competitor, great guy. Somehow he doesn't get nervous. That's what I've noticed. Maybe he just doesn't know that he should be nervous, or he doesn't know how big the event is. But if he's he's got his game face on, this is another guy that's very formidable that could ski his way all the way to that top spot on the podium on Monday. So uh, moving on to the top two, uh, kind of my personal skiing hero. Uh, Chris Parrish. What, what, what do you say about Chris? I mean, do we just do we just shrug our shoulders and go, he's Parrish? Or what, what, what do you got to say? I, I think you can say whatever you want to say, and it's all going to be <laughs> true, and it's all going to be false, because this guy has been around for forever, basically. In, in today's terms, I mean, you think about it, he and uh, Terry Winter and I have been skiing kind of against each other since, you know, back in Boys 1 or, or Junior Boys or whatever, back in 1992. So this guy really has been running 39 and a half off since 1996 or 95 or whatever. That's, that's a long time. That's almost 20 years that he has been running the 10, seven, five meter line in tournaments. So you think about that and there's a certain sense of comfort, certain sense of, of, uh, of confidence that comes with, with being able to ski that well for that long. And as long as he is in shape, as long as he's, not trying too hard because when he does try too hard, that's when he gets locked and loaded out of buoys. That's when he gets pulled up. That's when he skis straight to 2-4 and he can't make a turn like that. He's got to realize he can't ski the same line that some of those other guys do. He's got to ski his own line. He's got to stay connected on the way out and he's got to not overturn his good side turn. And I think he'll, he'll be just as formidable as anybody else on this list, Nate Smith included. Well, that does bring us to number one, and uh, if there's ever an enigma in this sport, if there's ever somebody who's misunderstood, and I mean, I'm saying I don't understand, it's Mr. Nate Smith. Top yeah. seed, number one in the world. <clears throat> Nate, has, uh, Nate has proven everybody uh, not wrong. I guess Nate's come on the scene and just annihilated everything we thought about skiing or everything everybody's been trying to do with skiing. Um, for the most part, he is the Ted Ligety, if you will, of uh, of men's slalom skiing in the in the pro slalom world. So, to see Nate to do what, see what he's done over the last couple of years, and then to see him continue doing it, I think last year he uh, was I don't know what happened. He misses Gates or something, but he has won Moomba. He won Moomba two years ago, and uh, that was his first year there. So, this guy nothing really gets to him. You think okay, maybe now on the Volga River in Russia, first world championships ever, he's going to get, he's going to crack. Or he's, this, this bumpy water is going to get to him. And it didn't. Okay, maybe, maybe now the Yara is going to get to him on his first Yara trip ever. And it didn't. So you just, you can't ever count this guy out. He only weighs 150 pounds. He's six foot three. He's very light on the ski. Uh, he's very light on the scale. That helps. He doesn't push when, it, when it's not time to push. And... He's got his game face on all the time, and that's that's when he's just sitting around talking to people, smiling. He's never he doesn't need his game face. He just he just goes out and does what Nate does. So this is the guy. Obviously, everybody's probably got uh, most of their money on to win. And if he skis how he can ski, he's going to be pretty untouchable, unless one of these other guys has a really good day or has stepped up their game significantly since last year, in my opinion. So Marcus. Um... Uh, not only is Moomba probably one of the most prestigious tournaments of the year, but unfortunately, it's also been the source of some controversy. Um, if you talk to enough skiers every year from the tournament, maybe it's not every year, you hear stories of uh, buoys rounded that don't go in the scorebook, uh, buoys going in the scorebook that weren't rounded, 
Uh, there's even a story, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, where one of the men's masters had their gates cut literally just to move the terminal on because they're running out of time. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know what to say about this whole situation. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it's sour grapes or maybe there really are some anomalies at this event. Yeah, you know what? I, I really don't know how to answer that because I, I try and I don't do a very good job, but I try only to judge or to make a past judgment on, on situations that I kind of see with my own eyes. Um, and at Moomba, the years I've been there, it's actually been pretty good. There's only a couple of weird judgment calls um, that I thought maybe were favoritism, but but n nothing really that I thought changed a whole lot. But I have heard in recent years that things have happened where people have gone inside buoys, people have missed gates or made gates, and been called you know the opposite direction. So I'll say two things. Number one. This highlights, in my opinion, this highlights a, a need for a better buoy marker. A, let's not call it a buoy, a better turn marker. Okay, it's called a gate. That gets confusing, but that's what they call it in the winter sports. And they've done huge uh, evolutions since in the last 30 years from you know various uh, types of gate materials to something now that you can blast and you can it'll break away, but you actually can see which side the skier goes on. You can see if they split it with their skis. We need that in water skiing. Nobody has done that yet. Nobody has changed. We made the buoy smaller. That makes them uh, safer for skiers. But we need something that's even safer for skiers and even easier for judging. And, and I, I'm just going to say flat out, that's what we need in the sport. If At the competitive level, if you want to take it to the next step and make a place like Moomba as fair as it can be. Now, the, the other thing I will say, and this goes strikes kind of at the heart of this competitive paradigm, and this isn't just at Moomba. This isn't just elite skiers. This is especially amateur skiers who are fathers and mothers of kids who are growing up to become like their parents. Everybody, as a skier, your goal, your sorry, your your uh, obligation as you set foot on the water is to call things as uh, fairly. So if you know you missed a gate, if you know you went inside of a buoy and you get it, you call it. You go tell the judges. Even if it's not a USA water ski rule and you get away with something, how's that going to feel? Okay? If if you say, well, other people are getting away with it, so if I get if I don't get called for that missed gate, I'm going to keep skiing. I think that's chicken poop, and I also think that uh, that's why it gets perpetuated, and that's why people still do it. I feel like if somebody put a stop to it and they called themselves out and that became the paradigm that, hey, man, that's so rad that, you know, you, you basically won, but you said, hey, I missed my gates. They reviewed it. Yeah, in fact, you missed your gates, and you end up getting third instead of first at the Nationals. I think that's admirable. I think that's what we want our kids to grow up to be like. We don't want them to grow up to try to, to, try to squeeze every inch that they can. We want them to grow up to be truthful, honest individuals, and that, that's especially in competition because competition is a reflection of your own life. So... I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that's I think that's really a noble noble approach you're taking. It just needs that. to happen, and I think the elite pro skiers uh, could could create that could could start it. I think we as athletes at the elite level could start that, and really you know I think it could take over and become the new paradigm, because I get tired of it. And people know when they miss buoys, they know when they miss gates. Just call it, let go of the handle. They don't make you ski anymore. End of story. Hmm. I like it. All right, Mr. Brown, we are way over time. Uh, before we wrap, uh, anything you want to tell the folks about what you got going on this year, what you got planned for uh, 2014? Uh, not sure. if Nothing nothing for sure, nothing solid. But uh, obviously my number one goal is to get healthy again. I've had uh, a low back chronic ailment, uh, ailment with my low back, and that's you know been for years, but it just kind of caught up with me to where I, I'm not able to go out and run really short line right now. So I'm going through steps, doing rehab, evaluating what I need to do to get back to where I can ski like I used to ski again. Not like I used to ski, not ugly, not bent over, not twisting, not doing all that weird crap, but ski again at that level with new body mechanics, new position, new alignment. Um, and that's really my focus. So uh, I'm going to try to do some coaching. I'm going to try to do some uh, t a couple trips. I'm going to try to do some filming. And... Um, yeah, try to get people on the water again. That's that's what it's all about. It's more fun 
the more people you have on the lake. And uh, I think that message we need to get out and we need to live that message. So that's what we're going to try to do. All right, man. Thank you so much for your time. I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, John. Thanks for this opportunity, buddy. And uh, can't wait to watch these guys and girls ski down there in the Yara. That's it. Wow, man. We, uh, I thought it was take 15 minutes. We did it in 51 minutes. So it was not by that far. It's all right. 